And then we have Eric Lombardi here, who is the executive director of EcoCycle, which is the largest community-based recycling organization in the US, and it's here in Boulder. And he has been with EcoCycle since 1989, and is considered an authority on developing community-based resource recovery programs. He has experience both nationally and internationally, and he co-founded the US Grass Grassroots Recycling Network and the Zero Waste Initiative Alliance, which is based in Wales. And today they're both going to be responding to this prompt. Is recycling necessary to... Uh, we'd like to thank the Federal Society and the School of Law here for hosting this event, and, and of course, Eric Lombardi for, for participating with us. It feels very much like a new court competition. You know, you got 10 minutes. <laughs> Arguments. May it please the court. Um, the, my answer to this is going to be somewhat disappointing because you guys are all law students and you've heard it before, is the answer is it depends. Okay? But there's misinformation abounds about the resource conservation, the human and environmental health benefits of recycling municipal solid waste. It depends on location, it depends on circumstances, and it depends on materials. I want to make a caveat before I begin my, my remarks. And that is to say that I'm going to focus on resource conservation. I'm going to focus on the environmental benefits of recycling. Okay? I'm not going to focus on the other potentially valid reasons that you might recycle. Okay? Commitment to a community norm. Um, the uh, exercise of atonement for being a member of the wealthiest society in the history of the world. Those might be valid reasons for recycling, but it's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about resource conservation. <coughs> the structure of my remarks are going to be as follows. I'm going to present several myths, really commonly held commonly articulated myths about recycling, and then present, prevent some, present some evidence that might uh, dispel those myths. First myth you often hear by recycling proponents is that we are running out of space for our trash. Okay? That we're going to be up to our eyeballs in trash if we don't reduce our waste, if we don't reuse materials, and we don't recycle <coughs> materials. I think the, uh, the impetus for this claim was the dramatic consolidation of landfills in the United States in the 1970s and 80s. Okay, the number of landfills went down dramatically during this period of time. Okay, folks said, the EPA said, holy cow, we don't have any place to put our trash. We're running out of room. We need to re implement recycling. And they, they articulated a goal of 25% reduction, 25% recycling in five years. But the truth of the matter was <coughs> that actual landfill capacity was increasing. How does the number of landfills go down and capacity goes up? Landfills were getting much, much larger. Okay? Instead of mom and pop dumps that accept a little bit of waste and then fill and then move on, these are industrial complexes. In fact, we've got more landfill space now than ever before. In 1996, landfill capacity was estimated at 14 years. In other words, if we stopped building landfills or expanding landfills, we would have run out in 14 years. And in 2001, that left the capacity was 18 years, and now it's well over 20 years. We're getting more and more room to put our waste. To be sure, landfill capacity has shrunk in some places like New Jersey. New Jersey does not have a place to put more rubbish. Okay? But interstate trade and trash, if you remember Colin Law, if you're taking Colin Law, is, is something that's been going on for quite a while. And that trade and trash, just like trade in any other resource, actually increases our wealth. Myth number two. Recycling proponents like to, like to claim that landfills pose human health risks. Okay? <laughs> That much of the concern is focused on the methane that off-gasses that is emitted from the decomposition of organic material and from leachate, the, the concoction of sludge and coffee grinds and soda and empty beer bottles or used to be empty beer bottles that, that percolate down to the bottom of the landfill. Okay? Old landfills, these were significant threats. Okay? We, they did emit a lot of methane as, as, as the waste decomposed and they did contaminate groundwater supply. But modern landfills, designed to EPA regulations, are essentially dry tombs. We capture something like 97% of all the methane that's emitted in the landfills nationwide. We capture all the leachate that drains off in elaborate piping systems and treat that water. Okay? They're sited, so design is one component, but they're also sited in places where groundwater interaction is virtually non-existent. Landfills pose almost no human health threat. If you don't believe me, believe the EPA. They estimate that the cancer-related deaths related to municipal solid waste landfills, now, now hear me, municipal solid waste, not the hazardous waste landfills, but municipal solid waste, is 5.7 cancer-related deaths. Not per year, not biannually, not 10 years, over 300 years. Okay? To give you some sort of context there, the naturally occurring carcinogen, carcinogens in celery pose a greater cancer risk than municipal solid waste landfills. 
Myth three. This is one of my favorites. <coughs> Packaging is the problem. If you look at the waste stream in the United States, roughly 40%, maybe somewhere between 30 and 40%, is packaging. So it's not the actual apple cores and the coffee grinds, but it's the bags that the coffee uh, filters came in. It's the cellophane, or if you could buy really expensive apples from Costco, the clamshells that protect the apples. Packaging makes up a large portion of our waste stream. Okay? And the theory goes that if we reduce one pound of packaging, we'll reduce one pound of our waste stream. So we ought to focus on packaging. Well, the truth <coughs> of the matter is, and this might sound counterintuitive, is that packaging actually conserves resources. It actually reduces waste. Why? because we've gotten really good at designing packages. Breakage and spoilage are at all-time lows. Okay? If we don't have packaging, a lot more of our resources break on the way to our end, end, end users, and, or they spoil. Okay? 30 years ago, roughly 30% of all toilets broke before they reached their end consumer. What happens then? You throw it away and you get a new one. Right? We've gotten better cardboard now. Okay? Better packaging, now something like 3% of toilets break before they reach the end users. Okay? Packaging actually, although it makes up a large component of our waste stream, actually reduces our total waste stream. Packaging is not the problem. Myth four, we're halfway there. I think I'm doing a lot of time. I usually do this in about 45 minutes, and so if it feels like I'm covering a lot of ground quickly, I am. Myth four, we're running out of natural resources. This is a, a myth that pervades not just recycling discussions, debates, but almost any environmental resource debate. Okay? Theory, and it's intuitive. <laughs> Right? We live on a finite planet, but we have an, uh, a growing population. Okay? We've, got a, we've got a finite amount of resources, but ever-increasing demands on those resources. So we, we're going to run out, right? Truth of the matter is, we're not. Okay? Over history, recorded history, natural resources have actually become more abundant. How does that work? It seems so counterintuitive, right? Human ingenuity is the answer. When we start to use up a resource, the price goes up. What does that do? It spurs entrepreneurship, it spurs in innovation. We do more with less. We figure out how to make aluminum cans much thinner. Okay? A, a feat of strength 20 years ago, if I had taken an aluminum can and crushed it, I would have been a he-man. I couldn't have done it because it's so, so, much, so thick. Now we've lightweighted it. It's so much lighter, I can, almost anybody can crush it. Okay? We, we've done more with less. When we can't innovate, we find more of it. Okay? When we can't find more of it, we substitute. This is how, and this is a, an age-old debate, and there's different, a lot of different uh, statistics will be thrown around, but if you look at the price of natural resources over time, they have steadily been going down. This is true, by the way, for renewable resources such as forest and non-renewable resources such as petroleum. Myth number five, we're getting to the meat of the discussion. Recycling <laughs> always saves resources when compared to primary manufacturing. Or, when I say primary manufacturing, I mean a, a virgin raw materials. Okay. <coughs> is why is why the claim that recycling saves resources, and this claim is true for some resources in some contexts. Okay, but it is far from true for all resources across the entire life cycle of products. How is it possible? It seems so counter. It seems so intuitive that if we start to if we recycle products, we'll be using less virgin natural resources. It has <coughs> to be that we'll be using less resources total. <coughs> But the truth is that recycling shifts our resource consumption patterns. Okay? So when we recycle aluminum, we, we got aluminum cans, we actually will mine less aluminum out of the earth. Okay? But we might also consume more resources, more fossil fuels, in collecting all of that aluminum. Okay? We shift our resource consumption patterns. And you have to look not just at particular instances, particular claims, but the entire life cycle of the process, the entire collection, sorting, and, and manufacturing of the, pro of, of the, of the resource. Consider, for example, collection. For most municipalities that begin a curbside recycling program, they have to add a significant number of trucks to their fleet. Why? Because we're gathering the same amount of rubbish in multiple trips instead of one. Okay? If you have weekly trash collection, and you switch from weekly trash collection to weekly trash collection and curbside recycling, you're going to have more trucks. Those trucks consume resources. Okay? The fuel, the trucks themselves, the tires for the rubber, the steel for the truck, all these resources are consumed because of recycling. And none of that ever gets included into the account. Now hear me clearly. Recycling does consume, conserve resources in some instances. But almost no proponent of recycling will ever go on the record and tell you exactly what the full accounting of the resource consumption is. Another category that's almost universally <coughs> left out 
of resource consumption comparison between landfilling and recycling is the time, your time it takes to sort, okay? It's not free. Even if you're a law student, your time is not free. You could be reading towards. <laughs> <laughs> but, you, but you take time to recycle, okay? And this cost is very hard to measure for one, okay? But, but there's been estimates that say if you pay roughly a, janitor, a janitor's wage, $12 an hour, and you measure how much time people spend recycling, particularly in New York City where there's mandatory recycling, almost everything has to be recycled, it ends up costing a significant amount of money just to sort all the different materials, okay? By, by one estimate in the New York Times, it was $700 per ton of recyclables for a, a market value of $50 per ton. Does that seem like resource conservation to you? Another word on, on accounting that I want to add, if in, in the instances where recycling does conserve resources, res the resource itself, the recycled material, has a market value, okay? So you might hear a, a recycling program in their facts and figures table say, we collected $30,000 worth of recycled materials in 2011, okay? And, and that might be very well untrue, and if it accounts for all the cost of collection, hey, sounds good to me, okay? But it doesn't, uh, excuse me, I lost my train of thought. Oh, but when you, when you hear that same uh, program um, or facts and figures table say, and we also conserve this many resources that would have gone into primary manufacturing, that's double counting. The reason that recycled material has a market value is because it saves resources, or it can save resources. So aluminum cans, for example, recycling, <coughs> making aluminum cans from virgin raw materials is incredibly energy consuming. Okay? Aluminum cans is the, is the all-star of recycling the world. To say that we have captured this many you know, dollars worth of aluminum cans, and we've also saved this much energy, is simple double counting. So any claim that you hear a recycling program or a proponent make about what they've saved, what they've, what they've done, look very carefully at their accounting and make sure that they're not double counting or ignoring some of the uh, uh, incidental costs that aren't directly related to the manufacturing process. Myth six, and this is the last one. Recycling reduces pollution. Okay. To many it seems, it's axiomatic that recycling protects the environment. It, it, it feels good, it feels right, doesn't it? But the truth of the matter is that recycling is a manufacturing process like any other. Okay, there's inputs, there's outputs, there's waste streams, and the question is if we don't consider all of those, if we focus on only a small fraction of it, we're going to overstate the benefits for recycling, and that's going to, that misinformation is gonna to lead to squandering of future resources. According to the U.S. Office of Technology and Assessment, it's usually not clear whether secondary manufacturing, such as recycling, actually produces less pollution than does primary manufacturing such as resources, okay? It's simply apples and oranges in many cases. Consider also that collection process I was talking about, especially if you have mixed recycling, okay? So if you shift the sorting from the users, us, to the folks who collect, they're gonna park their truck out front of your house and they're gonna grab your blue bin and it's gonna have plastics and paper and aluminum into it and they're gonna throw in, meanwhile they're doing this, and remember too that they're not driving Priuses, or is it Prii? That's political Prii. Prii. They're driving big diesel engines, and, my, and, and while they're sorting, that thing is running, right? There's emissions, there's pollution involved in recycling too that we often forget. Okay? Even if the benefits of recycling, terms, if, if pollution is reduced on net from recycling versus primary manufacturing, using raw materials, landfill, you have to ask yourself, are there ways that we could achieve the same results cheaper? Okay? Recycling is a messy process. Not many people like to talk about it, but it is a manufacturing process that does have its own issues. Could we achieve the same reduction, po po pollution reduction by implementing a higher federal tax on, on fuel? Okay. These questions ought to be answered. In terms of resource consumption in general, I'll, I'll conclude with this. If you look at the actual cost, the full cost of recycling, the big, where, where the hamstring is, is in the curbside. Okay. Voluntary drop-off, when people are, and, and mandatory, drop, mandatory recycling forces people to, re, to recycle resources that they otherwise would. Voluntary recycling and drop-off centers, actually, people's human nature, they figure out exactly what ought to be recycled and what not to be recycled. If you want a good metric for what materials you ought to recycle, what actually will conserve resources versus waste resources, look at what poor people do. Okay? These folks tend to have very low opportunity costs of their time. If poor people aren't gathering waste materials and trying to recycle them, there isn't a market for them, okay? There is not a, a conservation on, bet, on balance of resources from, from targeting those materials. In terms of positive policy recommendations, and again, this goes back to 
my being agnostic about recycling. I'm not anti-recycling, I'm not pro-recycling. I am, I'm not pro-landfill. I do think that we ought to have full cost for all of our waste disposal strategies, okay? So the, the, the policy that I would advance is to pay the full cost for landfilling, to pay the full cost for recycling, and let individual users consume, choose. I think with that, I'll conclude and hand it over to, to Eric. Thank you very much for having me. And I, do I get a rebuttal after? <coughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi everybody, I only have 10 minutes. Eric Lombardi from EcoCycle, your local recycling nonprofit. Um, so <coughs> the arguments that you just heard, I've been sort of hearing for my 20 some odd years in the recycling industry. Uh, so I think I'll walk through point by point. I, I don't want to get too deeply into it because um, there's actually in my mind a bigger discussion happening here um, and the real world operates in three ways. There's philosophy about how you'd like the world to work. And then there's <coughs> policy where philosophy meets the third sector called reality, human beings, and how the world really works. And I have an advanced degree in technology and society, which is policy. Okay, so policy analysis and resource conservation is really what I've been about for 30 years. And that's what you just heard a lot, a lot of policy discussion. Um, <coughs> What I'm going to share with you today are some statistics from the human real world because I've been running trucks and doing recycling. I guess I'm one of those poor people that's running around picking up recyclables. Um, I personally have now marketed, I think I hit the one million ton mark uh, this year. And industry has bought every pound I've ever collected of recyclables. Why? Not because they're green, but because it makes economic sense for them. It's now cheaper to make metal out of metal, paper out of paper, Plastic out of plastics, getting clothes for some materials, and glass out of glass. So we've turned the corner on all of these. Some of the numbers that I read in their updated version of the eight myths of recycling are woefully out of touch with reality today. Um, I want to show you because uh, Reed concluded, by the way, Reed, don't take anything I say personally, because we just met, so he can't take it personally. Um, but, you know, I have plenty to say about um, what I would consider the conservative right-wing approach to environmental protection because in fact there's this thing called the tragedy of the commons it's real we pollute our environment there's a bunch of us okay there's just no way around it and as a group we need to need to make policy decisions about how we're not going to damage our environment and the marketplace doesn't have any consciousness about that no matter what they say the marketplace doesn't give a damn about the cleanliness of your air or your water or anything else only we can care about that issue. So we have to apply, as I was surprised to just hear, he's talking about a higher federal tax on fuel. Wow, that's very progressive. I actually agree with about 80% of what I just heard out of reading. Um, and I'll, I'll show you those things. Well, I'll walk through them really quickly. So I get 10 minutes and I just use three. Okay. <laughs> First of all, myth number one, I agree. We're not running out of landfills. And that was never the point. I've been doing this for almost 30 years. Uh, the early recycling uh, organizations in the 70s, they never said we're running out of land. <coughs> they said we're trying to reserve, con uh, we're trying to conserve resources. That was the beginning of the recycling movement in this country in the 70s. It was the media that said we ran out of landfills. Go back to 1986, <coughs> the Little Garbage Barge, which was sailing the world, trying to find a place to put New York City's garbage. No one would take it because there was a fear that there was hazardous waste inside the barge. And it was on the high seas for a year and it was on day, the nightly news every night. Where's the barge tonight? And the media turned it into a landfill shortage crisis, and it was never, ever that issue for us, the people who started the field, okay? We're not running out of landfill. I flew over Nevada with a senator once. He looked out the window and says, there's America's landfill. <laughs> okay? so that's not the issue, it never was. So myth number two, landfills and health risk. Um, he, he admitted the old landfills are a health risk, and they are. They're, they're t poorly designed, they pollute the groundwater. In fact, it wasn't until 1991 that the EPA required plastic linings. Plastic linings the thickness of your credit card, which ain't much, but that's what they required in 91 to protect the groundwater. Just so you know, Boulder County's own landfill closed in 1992 because we were polluting the groundwater of Broomfield, the drinking water of Broomfield. That landfill, our local landfill, became a Superfund site, cost $13 million to clean up, 
half of which I paid as a taxpayer, so it was not privately paid for. Uh, and now to this day, I love this one, the EPA ruled last year that, okay, the groundwater's been cleaned up, a new cap was put on the landfill. This is 160 acres, two foot deep of soil, plastic covering, and all this other stuff. EPA handed it over to the city of Boulder and said, city of Boulder, you're now responsible in perpetuity to prevent rainwater from ever getting in this 160 acres. Can you tell me how much that's gonna cost? They don't know how much landfilling costs because no one knows what forever costs per ton. And that's forever taxpayers are gonna to pay to keep that 160 acres dry underneath the two feet layer, okay? So landfill economics are completely dishonest. No one knows what they really are. Plus, no landfill in the US has ever been excavated and cleaned up. These Superfund sites are still sitting there. They never, they never get cleaned up. So the damage goes on and on and on. So don't believe landfill economics. They're dishonest, they're not straightforward. They don't include all the costs that Reed said we need to include. Number three, packaging is the problem. Um, and he said we've gotten very good at packaging, and he's right. Okay, packaging is really not that big of a deal if you do it correctly. Of course we need to do it correctly. I love this one quote out of their thing. At least an earlier version it said, imagine shopping for milk and peanut butter if such goods were not prepackaged. <laughs> yeah, give me my peanut butter. <laughs> you know, this is the kind of ludicrous statements that you read in stuff like this. It's like, come on. Of course we need packaging. The point is you want it lightweighted, like Reed said they're doing. But the one thing they didn't mention in here, how about making it designing packaging for recyclability and compostability? Design it for the environmental recovery, not to be thrown away. What's so hard about that? We're seeing a revolution in bioplastic packaging right now, which is great, and recyclable packaging, okay? So that's what they gotta do, is push <coughs> on design for environment and packaging. Number four, <coughs> running out of resources, the substitution effect. This is kind of funny because what they say is that in fact, we're not running out of natural resources. It's not the substance that we really need. It's the function that it performs. Okay, and there's many alternatives. Is there an alternative to clean air? Is there an alternative to clean water? Is there an alternative to non-toxic soil? No, you have to have those three things in a clean condition to get clean food and clean, healthy bodies. It's not the service, it's, it is the substance in that case. And I think that, um, well, the best way, they say here, the best way to measure scarcity of natural resources, <coughs> such as oil, is to use the market prices of those resources. If the price of the resource is going up over the time, the resource is getting more scarce. Mm -hmm. Has the price of oil gone up? Of course it has. Have the value of recyclables gone up? Since I started in this industry, they've gone from an average of $30 a ton for the basket of goods to 150 today. That's a five times increase. So what does that tell you about scarcity? We are running low on resources. I agree we'll never run out because the last resource will get so expensive to get, we will substitute. But we are running out and in some parts of the world, we're seriously running out. And the local populations are getting impacted very heavily by the lack of good soil, water, air, minerals and stuff. So I think that we have resource scarcity issues which is becoming the roots of war. The greatest source of conflict on the planet is access to resources right now. The Pentagon and others have said it will be the reason for war in the 21st century, is getting access to these natural resources. So zero waste is the new peace movement. And we need to create a society where we're not creating waste. And I think there's good economics in that. And I'd love to join with these guys to make it so. One more minute. Um, <clears throat> what shall I do, 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 do? Time to sort? Come on. We've gone from one bin to three bins in your hallway, right? You've seen the compost recycle. How much does it cost you to put your hand there? <laughs> <laughs> 700 a ton? These are just fantasy numbers. And, you know, these institutes like PERC do this all the time. Just because they say it's so doesn't mean it's true. That's a joke, all right? We're making it convenient for you to recycle. You've got three bins right here in this school. Doesn't cost a penny to do the right thing. So don't buy that argument. Um, 
cost of curbsides the Achilles heel. Let me show you. Boulder, Colorado. And this is the local trash hauler president told me this. It costs $70 an hour to run the collection truck, whether it's picking up trash or recyclables. Then they have to drive the stuff over. The landfill now is running, let's say, about 20 bucks a ton. And so now you've got 70 plus 20, so you're at $90 a ton. Which, by the way, the national average is 45 a ton to landfill now. Okay, so now, so that's for trash, wasting it. Okay, and what about recovering it? 70 to go get it. You get paid 30. Right now we're paying you 30 if you're the collector to, um, well, actually, let's do it this way. 70 to collect it. And about, what are we paying right now? I'd say it's probably about 80 to process it. I run the facility for the county. So now we're into it for 150. And what did I just say the value is? 150. Recycling is breaking even right now. Trash is costing you $90 a ton with some of the cheapest landfill rates in America. In Europe, landfilling costs 200 a ton. Okay? So this economic argument doesn't hold water at the curbside level. The problem is that until we make recycling a 100% system, we have to pay for both. We have to pay for both. And that's why people blame recycling as being expensive, when in fact it's far cheaper than landfills. But this one isn't going away. So that's why we get hit with the added costs. But if you add the basket, and the city of Loveland did this, as soon as they went over a 50% recycling rate in Loveland, the community waste bill started going down because the economics started kicking in from composting and recycling. So I'll close with that. Thank you. Then it's good. Go for recycling. Okay. I suspect, though, and, and to, the, to the point that if, if I'm wrong, he'd be the only exception I've ever come across in the 20 or 30 times I've given this lecture, that there's not a hidden subsidy here. Doesn't, does not does <coughs> change the actual cost of counting here? Okay, recycling tends to not be anywhere near competitive with landfilling. We'll make a separate point about that later. Unless, with, with, unless you include giant subsidies from, from the federal, state, and local government. Second point. And I, this is actually one that I just kind of came up with, so uh, I haven't vetted it yet. But I want to <laughs> think about modern landfills differently than we currently do. Different than the dumps that we kind of characterized in that. Okay? I want to think of them as giant recycling bins. That if it ever becomes economically viable to go grab those resources, we know exactly where they are. They're not going to migrate much. They're not going to pose a health hazard to us. Now again, we've, I think we've agreed that there's a big difference between old landfills and new landfills. But in terms of you know, today's behavior, new landfills is what's relevant. Old, old landfills are old news. These are giant recycling bins. If it, if it ever becomes economically feasible to go grab those resources, we know exactly where they are and we can go and mine them and dig them up. Okay? King Tut would look better if he had been buried in a modern landfill than if he was buried in the sarcophagus. Almost no decomposition happens there. Okay? These are storage containers. To the point about, I, I guess I will make one more uh, point about clean air, clean water, and clean soil. I could not agree with you more that they're not, there's no substitutes for that. Okay? And that's why, if, if you listen to what I said earlier, that market responses to scarcity, the very last one on the totem pole, so to speak, the bottom on the totem pole is substitution. Before that, we get innovation. Before that, we get finding more resources. Okay? Learning how to do more with less. Okay? And it's the modern day environmental movement to, to throw a scare task and say, <coughs> we're running out of resources, where pollution is going up, the world is getting dirtier. Data don't support it. Okay? And he can pull statistics and I can pull statistics, but, but, but the bottom line is the folks who have said the sky is falling, the chicken little, the Malthusians, if you know who that fellow is, have been wrong consistently. Okay? And worrying about future wars and conflicts related to resource scarcity is one thing you can do. Okay? You can also act productively with your time. And that's the whole point. Time and all, these different all, the, all of the different natural resources, we have to think about these in a, in a holistic account. And most recycling folks are incapable of that. And I think you've heard it here again, one example of that. So again, he said, look how good 
the, the performance of Boulder's recycling program is. And I don't know the program as well as he does, so I, I'll, I'll take those as, as, as right. I suspect there's a very large subsidy that makes that even close to competitive. But take, for example, my hometown of Bozeman. We don't have, this is, this is how, how finely you have to cut in terms of recycling issues. We don't have uh, a baler for cardboard. Okay, so if we want to recycle cardboard, we throw it into a bin and it sits loose and it goes on a truck to Butte, which is 150 miles away, loose. Okay, so each truck is carrying something like 80 pounds of cardboard. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you start calculating how many emissions are, are being produced on the way to Butte. Okay? If, we had, if we get a baler and can condense that to a queue where it can go to a manufacturer, a, a processor, at a much cheaper rate, the emissions per ton of recycled material goes way down. <laughs> hey, it might make sense then. But until we start cutting with that fine analysis, pointing to the <coughs> officer and saying Boulder is the best performer doesn't necessarily justify recycling on a national scale. So again, hear me repeat myself. I'm not saying recycling is good, I'm not saying it's bad, I'm saying you have to look at the resources. You have to look at resource consumption, you have to look at accounting. And challenge folks that, that, that talk about how cost competitive it is, ask them if they're subsidized. There's one difference in moot court is I would have gotten the first and the last word. <laughs> <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> I say All right, so I got five minutes. Um, I think that the, your point about subsidy is um, a great one. The answer is clearly there's no financial subsidy to the Boulder program. I'll tell you what there is though. We changed the rules in Boulder. We did the politics and we got an ordinance passed that if you're a trash hauler in Boulder, you must also give your resident a big recycling bin. You must also charge them by the volume of trash they throw away. So you got to offer three tra size trash cans, really little, medium, and big. And let me tell you, we call it rewarding the recycler. And it's called pay as you throw, unit-based pricing, which I think your organization supports. Yep. It's the okay. one thing that every right-wing organization supports is unit-based pricing for trash. We did that in Boulder. We changed the rules. So if you're a recycler, you're going to pay way less than the next, almost half that trash can and 100% less than this trash can. So we gave the homeowner a reward for recycling. That's why Boulder does it so well. These numbers are real. There's no subsidies here. These numbers hold for other communities as well. That's the real economics. But other communities like Bozeman don't have the political cojones to pass any new rules about trash. They just take it. And I've consulted in Montana. I've consulted all over the world. I know Montana's challenge. But if Bozeman, which is one of the more progressive towns in Montana, can't have the discussion around rewarding recyclers with unit-based pricing, they're never going to get anywhere. And this is reflecting the true cost. Um, because you do pollute when you throw things in the landfill, and you pollute less. I won't say recycling is non-polluting. That's another point I agree with them. But you do pollute less when you recycle. And so that reward should go to the virtuous behavior of hitting the right bin when you discard something, okay? So that's how we did it in Boulder. We just changed the rules. And uh, this is very important. If we want green infrastructure, the pure, unfettered marketplace is not gonna give it to us. And I'm not criticizing the pure, unfettered marketplace. I think capitalism is like a Bengal tiger that'll devour you if you let it. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to put a fence around it. We have to keep it contained and not try to make it cuddly and gentle and go pet it. That's not what you do with capitalism. It's fierce and it's powerful, but you gotta watch it, you gotta control it. And that's what new rules is all about. We're, we're changing the, the parameters of the fence, where the tiger gets to run, <coughs> what it gets to eat, and that's up to us. Because the market will never, it has no morals or ethics. It can't self-regulate. It will just do its thing. Money makes money, capitalism. It's an ism, it's religion, money making money. And I'm not criticizing it. I'm criticizing us for being Pollyannish and thinking that this thing called corporate social responsibility is anything but a bunch of PR, because that's what it is. And I give this speech in the CU Business School. The professors really get mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> corporate PR is BS. It's one person has an office with a little plaque on the door saying we're green. They're not changing their business method. They're making as much money as they can, bless them, okay? That's not where the fault lies. The fault lies with us in not understanding the limits of the market. 
And when it comes to waste, it is a social issue first and a market issue second. And that's really the revolutionary thought that I've been banging for 20 years around the world, and the world's starting to embrace that idea. I got one more minute. I advise the company that built the Suez Canal. They're out of Paris. They're 130 years old. They have 66,000 66, employees around the world. They're called Suez Environment. And I've talked to the CEO, and they believe the future belongs to the corporation that can recycle 100% of a city's water and 100% of a city's waste. And I was just like, this is amazing. So I said, how come you're not in the United States? And he said, we'd love to be in the States. But, in the, but no policy means no business. He said, we build the best, green, greenest urban infrastructure in the world, but you have to have public policy to get that. If you just let the market go, you're going to get the cheapest, dirtiest. And he said, and you have no policy in America, so we don't do business there. That's what we got to change. And you as lawyers, that's what you ought to be working on. New rules to make the market the cleanest companies win. All right, let's open it up for questions. Um, let's keep them short. I had a question for Mr. Lombardi. Uh, one's real quick. Just when they collect a pound of recyclables, does that then translate to a pound of unit that can be sold? Is, it, is there any sort of you know, spin off or waste that you have to do with it and then you can sell it? Well, okay, so all the stuff, we the 50,000 tons a year that we're recycling over here in Boulder County, there is a certain percentage of non-recyclable stuff thrown in there. Which I mean, the stuff that can be recycled. Yeah, stuff that can be recycled. No, we'll, we'll recycle all the recyclables. But when it gets to the remanufacturing process, it won't be 100% conversion. There will be some losses on paper. Most metals darn near 100%. Glass is really close to 100%. But plastics and paper do you won't get 100%, you'll get a little bit less. And one last question. On the number example on the board, the left one for the waste, what are the units for the bottom number? Right, because you pay them $70 an hour and you pay $20 per ton of waste. Yeah. Are you are you getting a ton every hour? What? <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> um, actually, they, this, I mislabeled this. This is actually per a ton. ton. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, that's not right. No, that's 70 an hour. So, <laughs> And twenty dollars a ton to tip. Well, how many how many tons you collect in an hour, though? Is the question. It's it's Just yeah yeah yeah. yeah. It's probably one an about one and a half tons an hour. So it's close to one one and a half tons. Okay. So that's a good question. Yeah. Right. So I have I have two comments that I think would qualify as questions. So the first one, I think, <laughs> there's, the opportunity, there's the opportunity for a rebuttal. So I, I'd call that a question. So uh, the first thing is, it sounds to me like you're saying natural resources are becoming more abundant. And I think that that's confusing efficiency with creation. Uh, because you know, it's, it's a, a fact of physics that natural resources are not becoming more abundant. We are just becoming more efficient. And that kind of ties into my second question or comment that when you're talking about recycling versus trash and, and the efficiencies, it seems to me that you're getting confused between process and paradigm. You're saying that because recycling is currently less efficient in some ways, it's therefore, you know, I don't know how you'd make paradigm an adjective, less efficient overall. And the, yeah, I think you're right that, you know, landfills right now in some ways are more efficient, but you're arguing against a technology that hasn't been around for half as long as dumping. So we're very good at oh, dumping. Like yeah, exactly. <laughs> so so dumping dumping's got a pretty significant head start. It sounds 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 like we're comparing no, exactly. you know now to six hundred years ago. No doubt. And to, and to that point, we have gotten better technology at at, at taking care of our of, of having better dumps. Okay. To the point that I think we can store them there. Think of them as big storage vessels, so that if it ever does, if we're recycling the technology behind it does get so good that we get that it really makes sense to go in there and dig it out. We know exactly where it is. That's the point that I, and again, I'm, I haven't vetted this and thought through it a whole lot. We know exactly where it is. So why, what's wrong with, with not recycling it now and waiting until recycling gets even more efficient? Well, I, I think to answer that is if you don't do it, you never get better at it. So if, if, the, if, the, if the answer there is, well, once we get better at it, then we'll do it, but we won't do it to get better at it then you, you kind of chase your tail in a circle never actually go anywhere. I think you have to commit to doing it, and you have to commit to making it better so that it will become better. And I think that simply looking at the advantage that it has 
10 years out, let's call, let's call it 30 years out, as long as you've been recycling. In 30 years, I don't know what the percentage increase in efficiency has been, but I would hazard a guess that it's massive. You know, in recycling? Yeah, in, oh, in recycling. Absolutely. And I think that if you gave recycling another 10 years of solid effort, right. you're going to be not just balancing the equation, but radically shifting it. Mm -hmm. And if you base a policy on how it currently is, I mean, just pardon my language, but you're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not certain, again, to the point that the objective is resource conservation, that I'm persuaded that we ought to waste resources on the hope that one day we'll stop wasting resources and get better at conserving, using recycling. Because I think that's what you're saying. Is that, look, even if it's not as competitive now, we ought to keep doing it because we're just going to turn the corner. Um, I think that's on, uh, in, in the poker rule, that's called on tilt, and I don't, well, I I don't think that's a wise thing. It's the same argument. Oh, what, was the, what was the first point that you made? Because we, we, we skipped over that one. Oh, confusing natural resource creation with natural resource Ah, okay, resource so, so actual, actual available stocks versus what's <coughs> economically feasible to get out and use now. But mm -hmm. I would say that's efficiency, though. That's not creation, right? Oh, no doubt. We're not, well, we are creating some resources, more. So there's more trees in the United States than there ever has been. Oh, so, so, I Partly guess, because aside, we're consuming aside, aside from renewables or creatable resources. So like oil, you know, you mentioned that but oil is, is I think more what I, to me what matters is what's what's currently available. So it, it's not a it's not a total stock. I don't think that's very relevant. So in other words, say say we get continue we, the current um, efficiency gains in automobiles, you know, highway efficiency, fuel fuel efficiency continues. This, this issue of, of, of petroleum, I think, is not going to be one that we're worried about in the hundred years. Even though total stocks are lower. Okay? Okay. No, I'll, I will accept my reasoning. I don't agree with Keep this. Keep it short. So, so this, is, this is less of a like, controversial question. But I, I, I feel like there might be some agreement, and, and I don't know if it's both of you, that you mentioned something <coughs> with respect to capturing all the costs associated with landfilling. Does, does there seem to be like a, like if you could capture all the, you know the um, you know the, in perpetuity costs, discounted back to present, you know like is is that sort of where you guys find that, like some sort of ground to agree on that if landfill really truly, I don't know maybe it does captures, all the costs associated with landfill then that was passed on to the con consumer when they bought, is that sort of the position that you're advocating? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Pay to throw. Um, and 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 to your point, you might be happy here. We actually do have. Um, different graduated scale recycling where I live. I live just outside the city limits, so Gallatin County where I live, we, we do have the different you know, size, so, you know. But yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I think, again, not advocating for one waste disposal strategy over another. Saying, if we actually present waste producers, all of us, with the true cost of their behavior, they're gonna choose the rational thing. And that's where you talk about the Bengal tiger. I, I have a generally positive outlook on human behavior. I think people act rationally. I don't know if that's, taboo here, but I think folks <laughs> think weigh the costs and benefits, and if the costs are actually reflective of resource scarcity, then markets can actually not just produce the bare bones, crummy environment, but the environment that we want because we're facing the costs and benefits. Let me, let me add to that, because <clears throat> we agree on the full cost thing, but we disagree on how to assess full cost. Um, and there is a life cycle analysis done right now of recycling versus landfilling that covers all of the different impacts, upstream, midstream, downstream, of the landfill cycle and the recycling cycle. I am going to share it with Reed, and maybe we can um, discuss it later. But generally, the conservative folks disprove it because it really shows what the full cost of landfilling is. Europe's determined it's between 200 and $250, all the impacts and that they'd rather have a recycling society than a landfill society. Um, we're paying 20 on the front range of Colorado. So I, I think the devil's in the details on what you just said about full cost and um, landfilling. And, but that's where we need to get. I would love to see the true cost of landfilling at $200 like in Europe, because then there's no doubt. But we're not, we're not Europe. Resources. We could fit three Europes in this country. We have, a, we have more space. No, no, no. <laughs> space isn't an issue when it comes to landfill. It's the groundwater and the air impact and the resource depletion, which by the way, oil companies get tax breaks for resource depletion. Uh, the resource depletion that landfills feed when you don't recycle, there's a whole stream of economic impacts. Um, it's very political. And I don't know if you know the name of PERC before it was named what it is now, was the political economy 
Research Council. They understood that economics is a political social science. It's not a hard science. All right, last question. <coughs> I would just ask, based on your consulting and your research, Boulder's atypical. It sounds like Bozeman may be a little bit atypical as well. How much of the country is moving to the unit-based pricing, and is there momentum towards that or not? Yeah, there's over 4,000 communities now doing it. It's been the biggest revolution in recycling in the last 10 years. It's called Pay As You Throw It, and more and more communities. For the first time in 20 years, the mayor of Denver is talking about it. Because it's a politically hot issue. A lot of communities get trash free, and they think it's the only thing they get from their government for taxes. And you have to stop that. You have to, trash is not free. It's in the property taxes, OK? So like in Denver, we've been fighting for 20 years to get them to do unit-based pricing. But it's a political suicide for the mayor to all of a sudden start charging you for, tax, for trash when you thought you were getting it for free. So that's the wall we have to get over now. All right. Thank you guys very much for coming.